Hello, I'm Sophie Flynn. I'm the new member of the Treasure Trove unit and today I'm going to be talking to you about Treasure Trove in Scotland. This presentation is designed specifically for the members of Mesolithic Deeside and I'll be talking a little bit about lithics and lithic assemblages as these are the artefacts that you are most likely to come across. Before we um, discuss what Treasure Trove is and how the process operates in Scotland, I'd like to introduce you to the members of our team. Uh, starting with our manager, Emily Freeman. Emily's background is in ancient history and museum studies, and she has a lot of experience, um, both as a volunteer at National Museum Scotland. Um, she also worked on the Staffordshire Hoard project, and her background is also in numismatics, and her research interests include Romans in Scotland and how chance finds have enriched museum collections. She is currently mapping Roman coin single finds from across Scotland. The other member of our team is Ella Paul, who is a Treasure Trove Unit Officer. Ella's background is in ancient and medieval history and classical art and archaeology. Her experience includes working at National Museum Scotland as a World Cultures intern, and she has um, a background also in pottery when she did a pottery course at the British School in Athens. Um, she's also worked with the Visitor Experience team at NMS. And Ella's research interests include medieval Scotland and classical Greek history. Um, some of her most recent research has focused on the value of unprovenanced antiquities in museums. And Ella is currently studying Scottish Bronze Age material culture and medieval coinage. And then there's me, Sophie. Um, I am the other Treasure Trove Unit Officer. My background is in archaeology and anthropology, um, specifically in paleoanthropology and paleolithic archaeology. Um, my experience comes from being a past volunteer um, before university and after, um, and also as the Essex Finds Liaison Officer for the past for the Portable Antiquities Scheme from 2017 until the beginning of this year. Um, I've worked on excavations abroad and in the UK, including a Mesolithic site um, called Lunt Meadows, which is in the northwest of England, where I'm from. Uh, my research interests include the Middle Stone Age of Africa, the Paleolithic of Europe and Britain, um, early human behavioural variability, early evidence of art and lithics in museum collections. Um, and I also have um, I've taken a liking to medieval fingerings, which is a bit of a wild card for the very lithic focused research interests I have. Um, OK, so now we're going to talk a little bit about what treasure trove is. It is um, a part of Scots common law. And under that law, it means that the Crown can claim ownerless property, and that includes portable antiquities. Uh, there are no limitations on the age or the material for what should be reported, rather it just needs to be deemed ownerless. Um, in Scotland, the Crown's representative is called the Queen's and Lord Treasurer's Remembrancer, or the QLTR for short, because that is a very long title. <laughs> um, the day-to-day -day running of the Treasure Trove process is carried out by the Treasure Trove Unit. So what do we mean when an item is claimed by the Treasure Trove Unit? Um, essentially what that means is the Crown is exercising its right over the artefacts that have been found. Um, then they are offered to accredited museums in Scotland for allocation. Finders of those claimed artefacts are usually eligible for what we call an ex gratia award. And how are finds allocated to those museums? Well, it's done through a process involving the Scottish Archaeological Finds Allocation Panel, or SAFAP for short, uh, which is a panel of professional and lay members and includes representatives from National Museum Scotland, Historic Environment Scotland and Museums Gallery Scotland, along with independent members. Uh, the SAFAP panel usually meet around three times a year and they recommend to the QLTR which museums these claimed cases should be allocated to and the level of ex gratia award to be paid to the finder. So a little bit more about the law surrounding treasure trove, um, and this will be quite um, obvious to a lot of people who metal detect um, and field walk, uh, but it might not be so obvious to people who are working on community projects or um, on larger scale excavations. Um, the, the key thing to remember is that all land is owned by someone and you must get landowner permission before you search on land um anywhere in Scotland 
Um, another key point to bear in mind is that scheduled monuments um, are prohibited from being searched and artifacts cannot be taken from them. Um, so a, a good place to look is the HES, or the Historic Environment Scotland website, which is a portal uh, which can give you maps and information about which areas are protected and which areas are scheduled. So what do we do as members of the Treasure Trove Unit? So as mentioned before, we are responsible for the daily running of the system. And we are usually the first port of call for new discoveries and finders. Now, as well as doing the admin of the process, we also run outreach programmes and we do finds days, we do talks, we do training days, and we also engage in social media. As well as that, we conduct research and occasionally we will also conduct small scale excavations and site visits. So there are two types of finds generally, which are covered under the treasure trove process. Uh, the first type are chance finds. And these are the finds that we see a lot of coming through from metal detectorists and from field walkers. Uh, the process of how, how they come into the system and how they are assessed by us is that they are deposited with the treasure trove unit, either in our Edinburgh office or with us uh, via outreach days or finds days, which we hold um, across Scotland, which we are hoping to be able to hold again soon. <laughs> Um, the finds are then recorded. Um, we record details such as the finder, the find spot, the description of the artifact. We take the measurements of the artifact and we also take photos. The finds are then assigned a database number so that we can log all of that relevant information. Um, just to give you an idea of the kinds of finds that we as the Treasure Trove Unit um, see, basically the finds cover the range of British history and prehistory from the earliest um, Stone Age tools up until post-medieval, even into the, into, into the modern period. So we see a huge range of finds. So when finds come into the office for processing, they are either disclaimed or claimed. Um, if a find is disclaimed, that means the Crown relinquishes its claim over the artifact. Um, those finds are recorded, uh, put on our database, and the object is returned to the finder with a disclaimed certificate. Um, if finds are claimed, the find is assigned a treasure trove case number and they are processed further. Um, in those cases, the finder receives a report for their object. Uh, they also receive the recommended valuation and the date of the Scottish Archaeological Finds Allocation Panel meeting. So they are kept up to date with the process as the artifacts progress through the system. So as well as the chance finds that the treasure trove unit sees, um, which are coming from metal detectorists, uh, field walkers, um, anyone who is out in public and finds an artifact, uh, as well as that we have um, assemblages that we process. And um, what we mean by assemblages in this case um, is usually a group of artefacts found during an archaeological excavation. Uh, and they will have been excavated and recorded professionally. And so they provide a lot of archaeological information and context, particularly in how they relate to one another. However, assemblages can also mean groups of artefacts found together from the same site. So that could also be from field walking. Um, and as members of Mesolithic Deeside will know, you can produce assemblages um, by field walking lithic scatters. So assemblage is not always professionally excavated, but they can usually tell us about the context of the artefacts in relation to each other. The way that the treasure trove unit processes these assemblages is essentially the same as chance finds, but because of the inherent archeological value that most assemblages have in that they have some sort of archeological context, they are deemed significant and are claimed. Um, all finds and assemblages, even from community projects or excavations, must be reported through Treasure Trove, who, who will assess the finds accordingly. Allocation preference is given to local accredited museums, provided they have bid um, during that process. So I want to talk a little bit more about lithic assemblages and Treasure Trove. 
And what we mean by lithic assemblages here <clears throat> is any group of lithics found through excavation or field work, and that includes field walking. Um, even trans finds, whilst metal detecting, uh, of multiple lithics found together are usually treated as assemblages. And our process for dealing with lithics assemblages starts with an assessment phase. Um, now, the level of assessment we as a unit do depends on whether the assemblage has been catalogued by specialists already. So I know that Mesolithic D side um, <clears throat> have the assemblages catalogued by a, a fines by a lithic specialist. Um, but if we don't have someone who is able to do that before the fines come into us, uh, we will draft the report ourselves. Uh, and that report will usually detail the types of lithics found. It will give um, their likely identification. Um, hopefully we'll be able to date them generally. Um, and any possible connections to known archaeological features in the landscape. And to do that, it requires us to be able to do research into historic environment records, as well as contacting relevant colleagues and specialists. After the lithic assemblage has been assessed by the Treasure Trove Unit, the case is submitted to be considered by the Scottish Archaeological Finds Allocation Panel at the next available meeting. And once the assemblage has been reviewed by the SAFAP, it is then allocated to an appropriate museum, usually a local museum, uh, so long as that museum has bid for the assemblage. Excretion rewards are not given for excavated assemblages or those that have been found through professional means. The treasure, tro the treasure trove process enables local museums to bid for allocation of fines and assemblages, and there are several opportunities for museums to apply throughout the process. Once allocated, the assemblage is handed over to the acquiring museum, and is then accessioned, becoming part of their research and or display collection. Allocation of assemblages ensures that all important archaeologically relevant artefacts are given a place where they are accessible to both public and researchers. And this is just a small diagram illustrating the treasure trove process. It is relatively simplified, uh, but at the top, um, there are these are the means through which finds and assemblages come into the treasure trove unit. Um, the arrow indicating um, our connection with the QLTR office um, basically means that we work alongside the QLTR, whereas the SAFAP panel are separate and they are the ones who are offering the recommendations to the QLTR um, about allocation to museums, um, but also about excretion rewards. And then the final step is for those um, assemblages or artefacts to go to those museums. I'm going to talk a little bit about some recently claimed lithic assemblages that have gone through the treasure trove process and have been allocated to museums. So the first of our case study sites that we'll be looking at um, is a site in Kwanusti in Angus and the site has now produced two cases, um, two assemblages that have been presented to treasure trove between 2018 and 2019. They were chance finds, they were found by a member of the public who was walking and they include um, flake material um, and hammer stones. There was also some pottery that was found at the same time. Um, and the pottery itself isn't too diagnostic. It's likely Iron Age in date, um, but there aren't any sherds that are big enough to tell us any more um than that uh, now it's it's likely that this field is producing artifacts from a range of periods um but the carnusty lithics that we've treated as as an assemblage um because they were found in in a fairly localized area uh, yet they include hammerstones um, worked coarse flakes and flint flakes as well and there's some images there um of those three different types um, of artifact. All of these lithics treated together as assemblage were claimed and allocated to Angus Alive museums. I want to talk about another site which is a Mesolithic scatter site at Galashiels and the Scottish borders. Now these were field walking finds, they were found by a member of the public who was field walking and the site itself actually has quite an interesting history. Um, so the first reports that 
we were able to find of any finds dating, likely dating to the Mesolithic period, were from the 1920s uh, when some of those lithics were donated to a local museum. Um, the discovery of over 5,000 flints uh, was made by members of the public later in 1960, but most of those were kept by the finders, and so there are limited records of what those flints actually were and whether they related to the original finds found in the 20s, but it is likely, it is most likely that they probably did, um, because the site um, has since been producing more um, similar Mesolithic date lithics. Subsequent excavations in the 1990s found around a thousand more flints. Um, those excavations also aim to explore the context of the, the surface lithic scatters. Um, so what this case is telling us is that with good environmental records and responsible reporting, we can understand more about the lithics that are coming from that site, but also the site itself, and make sure that those artefacts remain available for study. Uh, this site in particular um, has a fair amount of historic environment records behind it. Uh, so the assessment process, or during the assessment process, we were able to go through some of those records and understand a little bit more about why those lithics were being found there and how we can understand them in the broader context of what is going on on this Mesolithic site. Um, they are an important part of the archaeology of that area um, and the assemblage was claimed and was allocated to National Museum Scotland. So we know that assemblages are coming into the Treasure Trove unit and they are being claimed and allocated to museums. But that is not the only product of the records that we are making as a unit. Um, we are hoping soon to be able to publicly release um, our data on a public database, uh, which is a really exciting thing for the Treasure Trove unit to be able to do, because it means that members of the public can see our data, can use our data in research, um, and get a real sense of what sort of things are coming through. Um, what sort of things are being reported, but also what sort of things are then being allocated and are available for study. So in terms of lithics um, on our or within our data set that will eventually be available, um, we have around 77 records of single lithic finds. So these are the chance finds that I referred to earlier. Um, and one of the highlighted finds is this picture on the right here, which is a potentially late Upper Paleolithic blade, which is found in Peterhead, Aberdeenshire. Um, it was claimed and allocated to Aberdeenshire University Museums. Uh, this particular artefact is uh, considerably significant because it, it represents a very, very rare example of potentially late Upper Paleolithic stone tool work in, in Scotland, in the whole of Scotland. Um, so it is quite significant. Um, the other picture here on the left, um, this is likely a Neolithic flake assemblage from Balmody, and it was also claimed and also allocated to Aberdeenshire University Museums. Um, in terms of the assemblages, lithic assemblages uh, within our data set, there are around 18 assemblages being processed. And we are planning to release our data sets to the public in segments, uh, with lithics being one of those data sets. And we hope that the publishing of this data, um, we hope that that will mean with increased visibility to the public, um, it will encourage the reporting of more lithics finds and finds with higher quality data. Uh, so what that means for us is we we want photos of those finds, we want the find spots and we want them bagged properly. Uh, now I'm sure um, the the members of Mesolithic D-side are very aware of, of how, um, how best practice operates in the field when you're field walking with lithic scatter sites, um, but we are quite keen to get that information out there to members of the public so they know what to do if they come across um, a site with many lithics or even just a single lithic. Um, and we hope that this new um, 
data quality and increased reporting will lead to new site discoveries and a more complete prehistoric archaeological record for Scotland. Uh, we also want to back this up with advice for finders who might potentially come across lithics in the field. Um, so we are aiming to work closely with community groups like Meet Lithic Deeside alongside partner organisations um, who can also help spread the word about responsible lithics recording and reporting. And there have been in the in the media recently um, various news stories such as the um, Stone Age discoveries in, in the Cairngorms um, and from off, off of the back of that there was a Dig Dig It Scotland produced this poster which you can see on the left here about how members of the public can help with that research if they come across any lithics in the field while they're walking. And Caroline Wickham Jones also produced um, a brilliant um, guide for investigating and managing lithic scatter sites in Scotland um, last September. And I do have links to um, those resources at the end of the presentation as well, if you're interested in those. Here we go, <laughs> these are the links. Um, yes, so as I mentioned, there are just some, uh, useful websites but also some uh, resources that can be downloaded online um, for anyone who's interested in um, how how you might go about managing lithic scatter sites or also how you might report fines not just lithics but fines in general and um, but also general interest um, websites like the historic environment portal um, which is really helpful for when you're doing research into um, land use um, and scheduling and things like that so that is it. That was a very brief um, introduction to treasure trove um, in Scotland, but also how lithic assemblages are dealt with and how they are assessed and allocated to museums. Um, and I would just like to finish up by thanking you, thank you for listening to me um, and also to let you know if you're ever in doubt about lithic find, um, whether that's through your work with um, Mies Lithic Deeside um, or if you're out walking on your own and you come across something you can always email us um we're here to help and hopefully you'll be able to check out our website and check out our new data sets when they are up on the on the database um, and also we have our various social media handles as well which you can see on this page um yes so thank you very much for listening and that is it from me thanks